machines reach for outer space and men are being trained to ride them we've developed fuels of amazing power fashion metal for undreamed speeds we control these giants but at the final moment only watch and wonder. We cannot ride them into the unknown. Yet on Earth, men have ridden missiles into the unknown. In these garages, they are built by men for men to drive. On this launching pad, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, men and missiles have been tested for 50 years. But on this, the Daytona International Speedway, half a continent away, the record books have yet to be written. At Indianapolis, the fastest racing cars in the world. Daytona, the fastest stock passenger cars in the world. Missiles guided by men toward victory. pits at Indianapolis, you leave the world. Your vehicles are as strange, as complex, as finely made, and as difficult to control as missiles designed for outer space. You become the thinking part of a machine. Each year you must start over again, searching for answers within yourself, reaching for the fastest way around. On a racetrack, originally designed for 90 miles an hour, you must average better than 140 miles an hour. Run the straightaways at 170. The unknown is a fearful challenge. Beyond 145 miles an hour, no one knows the speedway. A puff of wind a response too slow or too fast, an error in judgment of one one-hundredth of a second, any one of these. A day later, he's ready to try again. It becomes an act of faith to look at the wall straight on and keep the throttle down. To drive this track at speed or conquer outer space requires solution of similar problems. A race car, like a rocket, is a lightweight frame for a powerful engine. But the race car has a seat. Engines are limited in size. Only the most exact tuning can squeeze extra horsepower. Through constant improvement and research, mechanics and auto experts have managed to develop more power while increasing engine life. 
many products first tested here at Indianapolis now are standard equipment on America's highways. Recent developments at the Speedway include the repositioning of the engine so it runs while lying on its side. The mechanic and designer of car number three placed this engine horizontally and gave driver Johnny Thompson a car which qualified at better than 146 and one half miles an hour, a new Indianapolis record. A.J. Watson, veteran mechanic and car builder for Roger Ward, has improved his engine performance while running them in the conventional position. Watson has been twice the winning mechanic at Indianapolis. Only a few years ago, a sign like this in an Indianapolis garage was a practical joke or wishful thinking. Today, because of improved products and the knowledge gained from racing, the American automobile, passenger car or racing car, is a better machine. Qualifications drew 100,000 fans. The race, 200,000. 433 acres of people to watch men and machines race 500 miles. The sorting out is done. These are the fastest. Out of Gasoline Alley, out of the garages to the pits, evenly matched, no car slower than 141 miles an hour, none faster than 146. There's a threat of rain, but Roger Ward is ready. He told newsmen, I wouldn't take second place money now if they gave it to me. Tony Bettenhausen, 42-year-old national champion, has won more races in big cars than any of the others, but not at Indianapolis. This is his 14th try at the 500. Jim Rathman, 20 seconds from victory two years ago. This year, he wants to win. Brother Dick Rathman, fast, powerful. Johnny Boyd, finished third last year. Jimmy Bryan, last year's winner. His car was all over the garage floor just before the race. The cars are ready. 11 rows, three cars to a row. Then Tony Holman, Speedway president, calls. Gentlemen! Start your engines. The final countdown. The pace lap begins. A slow lap to pick up speed for a flying start. This is not the fastest place on Earth, but here is competition. Automobiles have gone twice as fast on the Utah Salt Flats, but here is the thrill of top speed in traffic. Strapped to rocket sleds, missile men have been carried for short distances at tremendous speed, but here is a 500-mile race. Something is wrong. A car not started. It's Jimmy Bryan in number six, the former winner. The crew roll the car clear of the track. In less than a half minute, the field will be charging down the front straightaway. Out of the fourth turn, 32 cars are gathering speed, heading for the green flag. The pace car pulls into the pit area, and the race is on. Inside front row jumps to the lead. A living tornado tears into the first turn. They string out, running in the groove, the fast, smooth way around the turns. Jimmy Bryan isn't going anywhere. Clutch trouble cripples George Sally's car. The heartbreaks of racing. Roger Ward moves into striking position. Thompson is averaging 140 miles an hour, but Ward tries a pass. 
suddenly, it is a race. Roger Ward in Watson's car takes a lead. In the first turn, a spin. Eddie Sachs in number 44 slides a thousand feet, barely missing Tony Bettenhausen. Sachs is out of danger as Bill Vanderwater throws a yellow flag, warning all other drivers to reduce speed and hold position. Eddie Sachs is okay. He stays in his car and an emergency vehicle gives him a tow, dirt track style. Sachs restarts his engine. There's the green. The track is clear for high speed, and Sachs limps to the pits for new tires and a checkup. They're on it again, with Ward still in front. Battling his way to second place, Jim Rathman in number 16 bears down on Roger Ward. Jim Rathman gets by. He's in first place. Pat Flaherty, winner in 1956, charges from 18th position to third. A.J. Watson checks the action from Ward's pit. According to plan, Ward is not running all out, making certain he will go the distance with only three pit stops. It's a calculated risk, while other Watson-built machines are running wheel to wheel at better than 144 miles an hour. Jim Rathman and Pat Flaherty are in a furious fight for the lead. Trouble on the third turn. Look out! Chuck Wyatt and Mike McGill spin. Judd Larson's in trouble. McGill, on his back, slides across the track. Wyatt races to get McGill out of the wreck. McGill is pinned inside. Red Amick's car tangled with Larson's and is also out of the race. Larson has also run to McGill's wreck. Wyatt, Larson, and Amick aren't even scratched. And McGill is not seriously injured, but all four cars are out of the race. On the caution laps, Jim Rathman gives up the lead and comes to his pit. Like the first stage of a rocket, his car is burned out. It must be refueled and fitted with new tires. 27 seconds and ready to go. And here comes Roger Ward for his pit stop. Watson and his super service station jump on the car. Specially designed pneumatic jacks are built into the car. Five men and only five are allowed over the pit wall to change tires and refuel. This device frees the crew and saves a handful of seconds. In 22 seconds, Ward rolls out in second place. Gunning his engine smoothly, blending with the traffic as he picks up speed, searching for Thompson, the leader. Ray Crawford hits the wall. His fuel tank splits. Again, the caution signal slows traffic while firefighters douse the flame. And Crawford, not critically injured, is helped from the cockpit. Johnny Thompson in the pits. And this may cost him the race. One extra pit stop gives Roger Ward his big chance. Ward in number five now has a tight grip on first place. Thompson out of the pits in 20 seconds, but a damaged torsion bar makes his car difficult to handle. Ward in the lead. But Jim Rathman makes his bid. He's only six seconds behind Ward. The mechanics know that this is the showdown. A.J. Watson and Jack Beckley, Rathman's mechanic, wait out the last 40 laps. Jim Rathman's brother, Dick, races into the pits for fuel and new tires. 
pit action has been amazing this afternoon. One car after another, taking on 60 gallons of fuel in less than half a minute. Something's wrong. Dick Rathman is on fire. Spilled fuel coming in contact with hot metal ignites, but Rathman stays with that car. He wants to race. Uh-oh, that seat is too hot. Dick Rathman is out of his car, and he's really hot around the collar. The fire is under control, but the car is out of the race. Rathman heads for the garage, sore as a sunburn. Ward ticks off the last laps, running smoothly for a new record. His crew and Bob Wilkie, the car owner, are riding with him. Jim Rathman passes everybody in sight, but Ward won't be caught. Pressed by Rathman, Ward is running 140 miles per hour. Thompson, handling the car beautifully despite a shift in the chassis balance, is running hard in third place. Ward comes down the main straightaway to take the white flag. He's on his last lap. Watson can only wait for his driver to come around for the last time. And there he is, out of the fourth turn and roaring for the checkered flag. Roger Ward wins the 43rd Indianapolis 500. And the checkered flag waits for Jim Rathman in second place. 20 seconds too late. This is Mechanic Watson's third Indianapolis victory. The man who built the cars that finished 1-2 and is mechanic for the winner. Johnny Thompson takes third. His flat engine car now holds the fastest lap time ever clocked in a 500, 145.4 miles an hour. Mechanics will remember this when they build for next year. Here comes Roger Ward rolling to the winner's circle in his ninth try at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He rolls down the path to gold and glory. Ward's share of the Speedway purse of $330,000 is more than $106,000. Both the purse and the winner's share of it are new records for auto racing. And the winner's reward, a kiss from film star Aaron O'Brien. Hot, grimy, deafened by the roar of his engine, and happy. The 38-year-old former fighter pilot shares his victory with wife Joe and their mascot Skippy. Roger Ward, riding a rocket, has gone where no man has ever been. 500 miles at record speed for the Indianapolis track. The shape of speed, first seen in racing cars, has become a symbol of our age. The sound of speed salutes race day at the new Daytona International Speedway. The largest crowd ever gathered at Daytona Beach, Florida, waits for the stock cars to run. This is the first 500-mile race ever run at Daytona Beach. This is a racetrack for cars not yet built. In practice, stock passenger cars have turned laps at 145 miles an hour on a racetrack which has been designed for speeds up to 200 miles an hour. The mechanics and auto experts can do no more. It's up to the drivers now. The pace lap begins. One slow lap before a flying start on a two and one half mile speedway. Three million dollars to build. Out of the pit road, into the main straightaway, leading to the first turn. A turn bank 31 degrees. In practice, Stock cars have run at 145 miles an hour, but how fast can they go in competition? Passing other cars, 
measuring their nerve and skill, while invisible forces strain and twist the chassis. At racing speed, the engine threatens to rip itself apart. And the wind is a living force, slamming drivers sideways coming off the corners. 59 drivers dare to learn about their cars and themselves on what is designed to be the fastest racetrack in the world. How fast can they go? 500 miles from now, they'll know. The race is on. In half a lap, the lead changes twice. Fritz Wilson, a rookie, leads them through the first turn, trying to stay in front out of the swirling tornado of traffic. On the back stretch, Wilson hits 140 miles an hour. Roaring up on the third turn, the lead changes. Bob Welburn's number 49 sets the pace. In five laps, the pattern becomes clear. The leaders wait for a passing chance, run in front, then drop back, saving their cars. The early leaders, Bob Welburn, Joe Weatherly, Tom Pistoni, measure each other in short bursts of speed, then wait for challengers to work their way through the field. The lead changes six times in the first 30 miles. The first 50 miles are run in 23 minutes, 142 miles an hour, the fastest official time ever recorded by stock cars on a closed course. Bob Welburn in a Chevrolet and Tom Pistoni in a Thunderbird blazing the trail. But half a lap behind, coming from 46 starting position, a black and gold Comet is working through the field. Fireball Roberts in number three Pontiac. riding at 145 miles an hour, Fireball Roberts has passed 34 cars in one of the most amazing rides ever seen on a racetrack. Roberts leads. Scheduled pit stops for fuel and fresh tires begin. Jack Smith brings in his Chevrolet. Pass smooth driving brought him into third place before his stop. Right behind Smith, Lee Petty roars into the pit. The crafty 44-year-old NASCAR national champion must refuel. Dick Petty signals his father. Young Petty is in charge of his father's pit crew. the front runner, Fireball Roberts Pontiac comes in, and the race is wide open again. As Roberts slows, Jack Smith Chevrolet is ready to race. Lee Petty roars away from the pit wall to follow Smith. Roberts is underway. Something is wrong. His engine stalled. He can't restart. Jack Smith roars past the pits into first place. Roberts is out of the race. Fuel pump failure. Two hundred miles becomes three hundred, with Jack Smith holding a slim lead as the laps are completed and the seconds tick away. 
Only 40 cars still running at 300 miles. The average speed, including pit stops, 136 miles an hour. A few can run that fast, mile after mile. Many cannot. Some pit stops are five minutes long, while mechanics attempt makeshift repairs. After weeks of practice and nights without sleep, the last thing you do is quit until there is no hope left. And no iron to run with. The steady hypnotic speed, mile after mile, is the great danger. Jack Smith, the leader, makes an unscheduled pit stop. The incessant running at 140 miles an hour, the unceasing pressure of competition, broke Smith's pre-race strategy. As precious seconds slip away, Lee Petty in number 42 and Johnny Bochamp in 73 roar into first and second place with their pit crews whipping them off. Petty, in answer to his son's signal, takes a small lead. Beauchamp hangs on Petty's tail, using the vacuum created by number 42 to pull him along. Number 48, Joe Weatherly, is a lap behind. the white flag. The leaders enter the last lap in a dead heat. Weatherly, a lap behind in number 48. Petty in 42, and Beauchamp in 73, the leaders. One mile to go. In the final stretch, Weatherly is high on the track, Lee Petty in the center, Beauchamp below him. The checkered flag. The race is over. Both Petty and Beauchamp clock in the identical time, 3 hours, 41 minutes, 22 seconds. Beauchamp and Petty both wheel to the winner's circle. Both accept congratulations of the crowd in one of the most amazing finishes ever recorded in stock car racing. The on-the-spot, unofficial decision went to Johnny Beauchamp, pending examination of photos. Both cars posted a speed of 135.52 miles an hour, 34 miles an hour faster than any race ever run by an American stock passenger automobile. The official decision, based on photos such as this, gave Lee Petty in number 42 the victory by a margin of less than one yard over Johnny Beauchamp's number 73. Joe Weatherly, in number 48, a lap behind, took fifth place. After 500 miles, Lee Petty's margin of victory was one yard. Besides driving a great race, Petty was mechanic for his winning Oldsmobile. Lee Petty becomes the winner of the first 500-mile event on Daytona's International Speedway. The test is over. The crowds are gone. The great launching sites wait for another year. In the garages, mechanics uncover the secrets of success and failure, while the moon sends down a silent challenge. In the missiles created here, man has dared to ride 
into the unknown. The same daring will carry him into outer space. Because men have always ventured into the unknown, the moon which lights the empty racetracks may soon become mankind's first pit stop, a refueling station in the race to the stars. <laughs> 